this isn't on, that's why. I figured it out, thank you. But every song must end And you never do So I throw up my hands And praise you again and again so all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I've nothing that's fit for a king, except for a heart singing hallelujah, I've got one response I've got just one move With my arms stretched wide I will worship you So I throw up my hands And I'll praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I've nothing that's fit for a king, except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, my soul, don't you get shy on me, lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh, come on, my soul, don't you get shy on me, lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord Oh, come on my soul Don't you get shy on me, lift up your song Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord Oh, so I throw up my hands and I'll praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah, and I know it's not much. But I've nothing that's fit for a king Except for a heart singing hallelujah Hallelujah So I throw up my hands And praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a heart Hallelujah, hallelujah, and I know it's not much, but I've nothing that's fit for a king, except for a heart singing hallelujah, Yeah, thank you, Brother Lucas. That was very good.
Praise God. Would you stand with me? We're going to pray. And uh, if you have a prayer request, you want to let that be known at this time? Anyone have a prayer request? I'd like you to keep praying for my wife. She has been in a lot of pain just all over the last couple of days. So she is uh, watching online tonight. And uh, we will want to pray for her. Thank you for praying for Sister Roberts. She is recovering and uh, she is looking forward to being back on Sunday. And also, uh, Sister Kara McCoy will be preaching on Sunday. So we'll have, we'll have a great time on Sunday uh, with Sister McCoy. And she is a world traveler and involved in so many various ministries. Amen. Anyone else? All right. If you'd like prayer for your body, why don't, as we begin praying tonight, just come up. Stand here and we'll anoint you with oil in Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to be in this great church. We thank you for everyone that calls this their church home. And we thank you for this night tonight. We have no promise of being able to gather again. But we're here right now and we're thankful that we can gather in your name. We're thankful for the word of the Lord. We're thankful for prayer. We pray for my wife tonight, Sister Thompson, that you would touch her body and bring healing, Lord, to whatever is causing the pain uh, in her, her body today. We're trusting in you, Lord. God, we know that our prayers are not in vain. We thank you for healing and touching and the healing process going on within Sister Roberts from her surgery. Thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for touching uh, Sister Laleen, Lord Jesus, and uh, Lolin, and we pray your continued blessing on her and uh, strength in her life. Thank you, Lord. And we thank you for this night tonight once again. We pray that your spirit would have free course, that we could hear what you have to say to us and that we would uh, apply these commands and principles that the word will bring out in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. We Welcome you here at the Refuge of Hope tonight, those gathered in person and those online. And we, uh, we, are, we know that there are folks watching online. We welcome you. We're thankful that, that you are tuning in. Uh, those of you that cannot make it out to church, we are very glad that you're able to still maintain that connection. Amen. A number of Wednesdays ago, I... I um, read this, this statement by someone, doesn't, we don't know who wrote it, but it was in the year 1912. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow the seeds of love. Where there is injury, let me sow pardon. Where there is doubt, let me sow faith. Where there is despair, let me sow hope. Where there is darkness, let help me to sow the seeds of light. And where there is sadness, help me to sow the seeds of joy. And th this lesson that we started quite a while ago and are just getting back to it now has to do with obtaining the reward of righteousness, living a righteous life, which also incorporates the word integrity. I think one of the biblical examples of the antithesis of integrity would be Ananias and Sapphira who sold a piece of property and they brought what they let the apostles think was the total amount that they'd received. And uh, they didn't go home that day. Uh, they were struck dead. Now, I have a very strong feeling that that wasn't the first time that um, they had been deceitful. They undoubtedly, in my feeling, had a history of that. It was a rather dramatic ending to their life. But uh, I, I think God had come to the point where uh, they needed to be dealt with after repeatedly having um, demonstrated deceitfulness uh, and having others have believed their deceitfulness. And uh, we, we talk about a man named Joseph in Genesis chapter 41 and, and verse 41. Je Joseph is a, is a wonderful personality 
to talk about. He had so many experiences that we can relate to in, in some way or other. Uh, Genesis 41 verse 41 says, And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. Now, by this time, Joseph had gone through a lot of things. He had been in, in prison. He had been forgotten about in jail. And, he'd been, and prior to that, he had been, he had been um, blackmailed by his brothers and sold as a slave. And, uh, but now, this part of his life, Pharaoh, the, the dictator of the nation of Egypt and the world empire, um, said, I have set thee over all the land. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him to ride in the second chariot which he, made, which he had. And they cried before him, bow the knee. And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. Now, this, this sounds like, wow, what a victorious thing. But I, we, we feel that, that th this created some challenges for Joseph. Now he was just this uh, regular guy at one time back in Canaan land and, and, and the weird uh, circumstances that took place in his life and he winds up now uh, due to the blessing of God in the second in command over the, over the nation of Egypt and he winds up uh, feeding, being in charge of feeding uh, the population during those, uh, seven, those years of famine. And... Uh, but we're going to be looking at some of the qualities of Joseph, Joseph's life. But first of all, what would we think if Joseph was a man in, in our sphere of acquaintances? Maybe somebody on your job. <clears throat> uh, maybe uh, somebody that uh, you know and you know of. And they were put in a position of great success. Uh, how, how would you feel toward them? Would you be happy for them? Or would you be angry that you got uh, looked over? You were, they skipped you and they gave the promotion to this person. Uh, would you look at him with an envious eye thinking, how did he get there? What did he have to do to get that kind of influence and power? Who does he think he is? Well, Joseph didn't ask for people to bow to him and he probably felt embarrassed when people did. Because Joseph loved God. And he stayed true to God through the various things, and, and including the circumstance that wound up uh, putting him in jail in the first place when he refused um, Potiphar's wife her advances. And uh, we, we find in verse 45 of Genesis 41, And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphnapaniah. And he gave him to wife Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. Okay, so Pharaoh lined up a wife for, for uh, Joseph. Now, notice that the, the end of, or in Joseph, in, in, he called Joseph's name, that, that Z name, Zaphnathpania. And in um, the letters Nath in that word, according to the commentary, refers to the God of Egypt. His name meant the, the God speaks and lives. So that was kind of interesting. And he was given a wife. And uh, boy, Joseph was just front page news there for a while. As a public figure, Joseph would face many oppositions, yet he was a man of integrity. Let's drop down to verse 50. And unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, which Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, bare unto him. Joseph called the name of his firstborn Manasseh. For God, said he, hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second called he Ephraim. For God had caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. 
and naming his sons as he did, Joseph proclaimed openly that God had made him forget all his troubles, even those in his father's household. Beyond all that, God made him to be fruitful in the land of circumstances that had brought him nothing but trouble. And in the midst of all that, God had blessed Joseph. Although our memory of events always remains, God enabled Joseph to get beyond the sting of the past. So Joseph names his firstborn Manasseh because he represents the removal of yesterday's sting. Isn't that interesting? Joel chapter 2 verse 25, Joel writes, And I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. The lesson here is that it's very tempting to try to get revenge on people that had put you in these negative situations, like Joseph's brothers, the Rubens, the Dans, and even the Mrs. Potiphar's of our lives. To get back at those who stung us and gnawed on us with evil deeds and ugly words, instead, we must give birth to a Manasseh. Is it time to ask the Lord to erase the sting of our memory because only he can do that. Then it will be time to give birth to an Ephraim to remember how God has abundantly blessed. Ephraim means multiple blessings. We have an Ephraim in our church. And that means multiple blessings. Let's look at verse 53 down to verse 57. And the seven years of plenteousness that was in the land of Egypt were ended. And the seven years of dearth began to come, according as Joseph had said. And the dearth, or the famine, was in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, Go unto Joseph, what he saith to you, do. And the famine was over all the face of the earth, and Joseph opened all the storehouses, and sold unto the Egyptians, and the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. And all countries came into Egypt to buy, uh, to Joseph for to buy corn, because of the famine was so sore in all the lands. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20, Paul says of the Ephesian church, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly, above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Although Joseph seems to have it all in worldly standards, he continues to walk humbly with the Lord. He has earthly power, but his integrity is still intact. Our integrity gets challenged quite frequently in life, especially around tax time. Are all those receipts that we're using for deductions, are they really real? Is that right? You know, all that and integrity. Integrity is, is living honestly. Living honestly. Even though it, it may cost, even though it may create hardship, God wants his people to live with integrity. Amen. And we're going to be talking, hitting on more uh, scriptures regarding that. And so Joseph here is in this position, second in authority. He gives out food to all the people that come. We cannot help but admire those that reap the rewards of righteousness because God prospers them when they in turn provide for others in need. Maybe you've known of somebody that you kind of envied because of their position, but then you see what they in turn do to help other people. And that kind of calms down those feelings of jealousy because they are using their position or their resources to be a blessing to other people. God can use our authority and our abundance and our advancement as he did with Joseph. But before he can, we need to humble ourselves saying, Jesus, I need you. I have all this to account for, and I can't take any of it with me. Please use me as you see fit. Someone said, with authority comes the need for accountability. With popularity comes the need for humility. 
with prosperity comes the need for integrity. Joseph passed all three tests. Integrity is an essential virtue that reflects honesty, sincerity, and moral principles. Joseph's story teaches us that integrity is not just about doing what is right, but also about maintaining our moral principles in the face of temptation and adversity. Maintaining our moral principles in the face of temptation. Hmm. Well, amen, amen. Joseph could have easily compromised his beliefs, taken advantage of his position. Who's going to see me? Who's going to know? But he chose to remain faithful to God and honor God's values because God sees everything we do. He knows the thoughts that we think of which we are accountable for. This unwavering commitment to integrity ultimately led to his success and favor with God. He loved God. We have this story in the, in the scriptures about Joseph, not because he, he is some person that far exceeds anybody else. Any one of us here today could be, could be a Joseph. And he could be any one of us here. It's just that these are the circumstances we read that happened to his life. And the Bible is, a, is just, a, 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 just a small smattering of experiences in the course of human events. But these are the experiences that God wanted us to know about in our lives. Of all the millions of people that have lived, we have 66 books about these particular people. And no other ones. These are the ones God wanted us to read about. These are the people God wants us to take, to, to take stock into and, and uh, stay away from certain qualities of, these, of this type of a person, but yet uh, apprehend and, and take on the qualities of, of this kind of type of a person. And so when we read about Joseph, he's not some, some, some uh, angelic being. No, he, he's a person just like you and I have the same situations, thinks, thinks the same way, encounters situations just like you and I do. And all the way through Scripture, people are like that. They're just everyday people that God worked with in a particular way for our benefit so that we could live successfully. That if Joseph can live successfully experiencing what he did, then I can too. Yeah. <clears throat> if Joseph could say no to Potiphar's wife when there were just the two of them in the room, she was probably quite the looker. And, uh, and yet there was something within this young man that wasn't driven with, with uh, uh, moral satisfaction, you know, immoral satisfaction, but he had God in his mind. And he told her, he said, your husband has put me over all the household, but you. And I, I, I can't do this thing and violate God. And so she tried to get even with him for rejecting her. And it looked like things were going really bad. And I'm really kind of stuck on this, on this word, why. It seems to come up here in my, in my thinking, in my ministry here in recent weeks. Undoubtedly, while he was in the prison, I mean, you can you imagine, he probably wasn't in a place, you know, where he could, you know, have a microwave and a TV. He got accused of making advances To, to a fellow that, in, in one, one commentary said that Potiphar was over, he, he's captain of the guard, but when you, when you uh, in one, one commentary, uh, define the captain of the guard, I mean, the, these guys would, in one area that I read, would rather just do away with you than even think two minutes about you. And here he is accused of making advances to this guy's wife. So he's just not going to pat him on the hand and say, not nice, not nice. I would imagine that the dungeon that he was in was a, a bad situation. Don't you imagine he asked God, God, why? 
He didn't know why. He was living right. He did what he was supposed to do. And that's where he wound up. Paul and Silas were living right. They cast the demon out of this gal. They wind up getting beat and thrown in prison. God, why? But in both cases, even though they didn't know the why, they knew a God that knew the why. And that in itself is what kept them going. I know that God knows why. And I'm going to maintain my faith in him. I'm going to maintain my integrity in him. Amen. What a great thing. Boy. Unwavering commitment to, to integrity ultimately led to Joseph's success. Now, how about Job? Another character in the Bible that exemplifies integrity. Wealthy man, lost everything he had, including his family, possessions, and his health. Despite these trials, Job remained faithful to God and refused to curse him or to blame him for his misfortunes. He acknowledged that God was sovereign and just, even though he didn't understand why he was suffering. In the end, God restored Job's fortunes and blessed him with even greater wealth than before. Job's story teaches us that integrity is not just about doing what is right when things are going well, but also about maintaining our faith and trust in God when we face difficulties and trials and temptations. When the people of God go through things, not always do they get everything back twice. No. Sometimes they suffer the rest of their life, whether it's physically or in some other way. They don't have some glorious... That, that's what we got to be. We got we to keep our heart open to all things that, as we can, as we read these examples in the Bible. Not everybody gets a glorious deliverance. Sometimes people, the people of God, what the Apostle Paul, I mean, shipwrecked, beat, left for dead, on and on and on it goes. He didn't have any glorious deliverance in his life. He knew he was going to die. He knew that the ministry that God had for him was going to lead him to Rome, and after that he was going to die. His life would be taken. That was his ministry. Wouldn't you have thought that he, could, he would have asked God, God, Boy, just like Jesus prayed, let this cup pass from me. Maybe Paul said, God, I don't know. The closer I get to getting to Rome and talking to the king about the faith, uh, it's, it's going to be curtains for me, and I, I don't know if I want to die yet, God. Uh, isn't there some other part of the plan that you could, you could put together and I could live a little longer maybe? But then you have the story of Job. But just think of the emotional, the emotional things that he carried the rest of his life. I'm sure he didn't forget all that. The struggle, the loss of his, what, 10 children? Evidently he had more kids. But he, he, he carried that. He carried the loss of his, his finances and his family and, and this deal with his three so-called friends that were accusing him of, of having done wrong and and when his three friends came to visit him, they sat there for seven days staring at him before anybody said a word. You don't want those guys as a neighbor. Accusing. It's so easy to accuse somebody. Nah, I know why you're in this mess. It's because you've done... What? Yeah. Be a person that, that, that is slow to judge and quick to forgive. Be a person that considers somebody innocent until proven guilty. Instead of the other way around. Guilty and, and they've got to they gotta prove their innocence. Yeah, we, we do that sometimes, don't we? We make other people prove that they're innocent before we can carry on and have a relationship with them. And so another one is Daniel. 
Daniel, a young man who was taken captive by Babylon when Babylon conquered Judah. And all, and all these thousands of, of Hebrew people were taken captive into the country of Babylon. But Nebuchadnezzar chose, uh, had, had a number of young people chosen to be uh, groomed in, in, in the Babylonian uh, political system. And, uh, but yet, as we know this beautiful story, Daniel refused to eat the king's meat because that king's meat violated the, the, the Hebrew dietary laws. These, uh, the, 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 the food had been uh, offered to their gods. And, uh, and then they were fed, that meat then was fed to the Hebrew people. But Daniel and his friends, they refused that. That's integrity. That's integrity. They, they weren't going to violate their dietary laws because they were in a foreign land. They were in a new culture. They had never been, they, they, they didn't know about that. And, and now being ruled over by these people, you talk about a step of faith because the guy that the intermediary person that, that dealt with them and, and provided their food and all that, he was, he was worried about his own life because he was thinking that if these guys don't get fattened up and if they, if they look weak and anemic, uh, the, the king ultimately would, would take his head or something. And Daniel said, ah, oh, just let us, our God's going to take care of us. You just prove it, what, 10 days or whatever it was? Then we'll show you. We'll show you what, what's going to happen here. And as it turns out, they were in a lot better shape than the rest of them. And they're going, wow. So they, they, ate, they ate food that was pleasing to Jehovah God. They kept their dietary laws in the midst of their confinement in, in, in Babylon. You know what? You can live for God. I can live for God in the midst of, of difficulty. Because as God's grace helped these people, and we read the story of Daniel and all of his experiences, because there are parallels to our lives. Somewhere, somehow, our lives run along a similar track as Daniel. And he had integrity, and he was determined, he was going to live for God, he was going to keep his prayer time even though he knew that there were people blackmailing him and went to the king and said, if anybody calls out to any god other than you, let him be killed, right? But, and he knew the writing was signed, but at that time of day, he went to his window and he began to pray to God, Jehovah God, and those people heard him. They went to the king. Well, it wasn't time for Daniel to die yet. And... Uh, he maintained his integrity. He refused to bow to the king's statue, even when threatened with death. As a result, God protected Daniel and his friends, and they were able to prosper in Babylon. This affected Nebuchadnezzar. When Nebuchadnezzar got so angry because he refused to bow and or refused, refused these, these, these situations that, that the king had set up, that we find, I think it's in Daniel chapter 4, where, where there was a change of Nebuchadnezzar's heart. And, and he, on, he began to honor God. And for all we know, uh, the end of Nebuchadnezzar's life was he had a relationship of some kind with Jehovah God. But he tried, he tried putting Daniel to death, you know, and it, and it didn't work. He saw the hand of God in his life, that this young person was going to live for God. As Nebuchadnezzar said, in spite of what the king said, he was still going to be true to his God. Nebuchadnezzar recognized that, and that spoke to him. And I'll tell you, people see that in the life of Christians today. When they will take a stand for what's right, even though they may not agree with it, they, they notice this person is sticking up for their faith in spite of the perhaps ridicule or the peer pressure to, to whatever it would be. They're, they take notice that they're sticking true to their convictions. That's integrity. Amen. So Daniel's story teaches us that integrity is not just about doing what is right for ourselves. 
but also about standing up for what is right in the eyes of God, even when it's not popular or convenient. Daniel's faithfulness to God ultimately led to his protection and prosperity despite the challenges he faced. Then we have Ruth. Uh, she was a Moabite who married an Israelite into an Israelite family. Her husband dies, and she refuses to abandon her mother-in-law, Naomi. And they return when Naomi goes to, back to Israel because the famine in Israel was over. Uh, now um, Ruth joins my, Naomi, her mother-in-law, going back to Israel. And despite the challenges of being a foreigner in a new land, Ruth remained faithful to God and Naomi. She worked hard in the fields to provide for them, even marrying Boaz, a close relative of Naomi, in accordance with Jewish custom. So she, she embraced the Jewish customs. And she, she showed her mother-in-law that she's not afraid to work, and she provided food, and she went out into the fields and gleaned the grain that were left for her to be able to get her commitment to Naomi and her willingness to work hard and sacrifice for her ultimately led to her being blessed and in favor with God. Of course, Jesus is the ultimate example of integrity living a sinless life, always doing what's right. Well, he is God in the flesh, right? But the Bible says he was tempted in every way that we are. We need to remember that, that when we feel temptation, when we feel these things pulling against us that we know are not convenient, we know that they're not right with God, we've got to remember Jesus also in his short years of ministry, three and a half years of ministry, he, in, in, he was able by, by, by God's inner interaction to experience every kind of stress or struggle that humanity would go through. What, what a wonderful thing. He never wavered in his commitment to his calling, even when faced with intense persecution and suffering. He taught his disciples to love their enemy, to forgive those who wronged them, and show compassion to the poor and needy. Jesus ultimately demonstrated his integrity by sacrificing himself on the cross for the forgiveness of sins, fulfilling his plan for the salvation of, of you and I. His life and teachings teach us that integrity is not just about doing what is right, but also about loving and serving other people. Amen. His commitment to God's will and his selfless sacrifice on the cross demonstrated his unwavering integrity and love for humanity. Well, the Bible has many examples of men and women who demonstrate integrity. We have people in this congregation I know of that demonstrate integrity on a regular basis. Living a life of integrity means staying true to our beliefs and values, even when faced with opposition or difficult circumstances treating others with respect and kindness, even when it's not reciprocated, being honest and truthful in our, in our words and actions, even when it's easier to lie or to deceive. As Christians, we're called to live a life of integrity that honors God and reflects his character to those around us. We can cultivate integrity in our lives by starting with small acts of honesty, kindness, and respect, we must be willing to speak the truth, even when it's uncomfortable, and treat others with love and compassion, even when they don't deserve it in our mind. We can seek, of course, counsel and guidance from God to help us as we read his word, as we pray. He will help us. Living a life of integrity is not always easy, but it is essential for our spiritual growth and well-being. We must remember that our actions and choices have a significant impact on those around us. And we must strive to be men and women of integrity who reflect God's love and character to the world. Amen. Would you stand with me as we pray? Lord Jesus, we thank you for this assembly. We thank you, Jesus, of how you are working with us over this past number of months, you're working with us, you're helping us, you're helping us to look inside of our hearts to see us and maybe in a new, fresh way, how we live. And God, we want to live honesty, honestly. We, we want to demonstrate integrity. We want to have integrity in our heart. And so, Jesus, don't let us live on in, 
in hypocrisy or uh, deceiving ourselves. Don't let us live a lie, but help us to see things that need to be dealt with, Jesus, so that we can be that light in this dark world. Oh, God of heaven, oh, God of heaven, how this world needs the true light of the gospel to shine, to illuminate, to help them, to guide them in the way to salvation. And Jesus, we're thankful that you have shown us the way. You put people in our lives. We thank you for, the, for repentance. We thank you for baptism in the name of Jesus. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. We thank you for the fruit of the Spirit, the, the gifts of the Spirit, and all the operations of the Spirit. And we thank you that we can gather together like this and, and uh, have instruction so that we can be effective soldiers of the cross. We give you praise for it all today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless us all in Jesus' name. Thank you for being in church tonight. Lord willing, we'll see you on Sunday.